amongst people who are have illnesses or sick family members or autistic kids or um, in one case there was a family where they had quadruplets and one of the kids died. Um, so all, all different sorts of requests I got and I would read them and I'd call the people and we'd talk and you know for the most part everyone got a machine and last year I gave away I think it was 62 machines from the summer till about November because I, did, I decided to take December off, and then I started again in January, and I gave away 17, and now I'm up to 79 machines. Wow, that's amazing. So That's amazing. So all that I ask of the people who get the machines is that they pay it forward somehow, however yeah. they deem, and the amazing thing is all these people are suffering. They're, they're not flush with money, yeah. and they're almost always doing things for charity, which is really amazing yeah and the only other thing i ask is that they send me photographs because yeah. i want to i want to feel that i made the right decision yeah. in having selected them and i want to make sure they're using the machine and stuff like that so yeah. and i like to post it and it's a feel-good thing yeah so i like other people to see it and you know yeah. um i get a lot of really nice comments and people appreciate what i'm doing but it makes me feel good and I, you know when i see these pictures it makes me smile and and i know sewing is a good thing for people. Sewing is a good so, uh, thing for people. It really and, is. and it helps our industry, which, you know, I think our industry is uh, in a little bit of a downturn and has been for a little while. Yeah, um, tell, tell me a little bit about that. You, you, um, you call it the sew revolution and you're trying to make things better in your industry. Tell me what's going on and why you feel like you need to help make it better. Well, it, it's kind of funny how that developed. It kind of started just because of the sewing machine thing. Yeah. Um, I started thinking, you know, if I give away a lot of sewing machines, more people will be sewing, and our industry could definitely use some help right now. There's definitely too many suppliers, too many people selling fabric, just very crowded. Yeah. Um, I would say not that many people are thriving uh, in the industry. You know, people are just getting by. Yeah. And I would say there are probably some shops and people selling fabric and saying, geez, I wish I wasn't in this or I'm losing money. And, and you know, no one wants that. Um, you know, it's very stressful to be in a business when you're not making money. <clears throat> um, so anyway, so it kind of just it was like the egg before the chicken. I started doing sewing machines and then I decided to say, hey, we our industry needs help. Uh, the numbers are dwindling. I mean, I, I think when I came in. They were saying there were maybe 15, 20 million people sewing. And now more recently, I saw it was 7 to 10 million. So listen, I'm 45 years old. I, wa I have two, two boys. My brother has two boys. My sister has two girls. Uh, we definitely have the fifth generation ready. Uh -huh. um, and uh, <laughs> I, I'll nice do there, what right? I, I want to do what I can to try to help the industry as well. So, you know, listen, there are a lot of positive benefits from Sewing and quilting, creativity, relaxation, uh, taking stress away, <clears throat> excuse me, all all positive things. Yeah, interesting. So, um, you know, listen, it's a good mission. Yeah. And hope, you know, I just hope more people kind of embrace it and start talking about it. Yeah. Um, huh. I'm trying. I'm trying so to just, do the best I can. To, those that are listening, just go out and buy more fabric. <laughs> Is that our mission? Is that our goal? <laughs> I mean, the well, funny well, part is that like we're all buying a lot of fabric, right? The stash stuff, the whole like how much is how much you know how much is your stash worth is huge, right? So it's I ironic because it feels like everyone's buying a lot way too much fabric more than they can sew, but we need to buy more. Well, I think people are dropping out of sewing. I think mm, that's the bigger. I, I think you're right. A lot of people do have fabric, and those people will continue to have fabric. But yeah. you know, sometimes if you live near Hancock and we're buying fabric from them on the cheap yeah and maybe you're not as mobile maybe you said you know what I, i'm done yeah. can't do this anymore you know maybe those people are not as sophisticated and don't want to get on the internet and go buy from a company song on the internet yeah. fabric yeah they're all old school they're touchy feely and maybe yeah. they say you know what i'll get rid of my machine i'll get rid of my stash uh, you know yeah. I did you, find something else do you to see, do uh, what about the younger generation the sort of diy uh you know make the crafty Gemini and all these others that are like promoting. Do you see that as helping the industry at all? The kind of absolutely, absolutely. A lot of you know the uh, the show with um, 
Heidi Klum, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of, and, and a lot of people are making, starting to make their own stuff again and be yeah. creative and, yeah. um, repurp- repurpose clothing or, cha- you know, do that, do really creative things. And yeah. I think that definitely helped. There's also the, you know, the modern guild, that yeah. whole movement is yeah. definitely on the rise. And that's, yeah. I think, attracting more of the younger people. But that's also part of my so revolution where I'm trying to say to people, hey, you know, go teach your kids how to do it. Go teach your neighbors. You know, your kid yeah. wants to do it. Maybe your kid could get three of their friends to come also. Yeah. Um, maybe we could get, you know, home ec classes to, you know, to come back. Um, yeah. It's so you know, funny. That's the, the problem. The amount, the amount of people that I interview that start with, well, I started in home ec is remarkable. It's about half, I would say, that say, and we don't really have that anymore, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember going to uh, Fabric Center and buying fabric for a project that I had to make in, in middle school and mm-hmm. high school. And that just isn't really around anymore. But uh, miraculously, <clears throat> you know, I live in New York and everyone, whenever I say fabric, I'm in the fabric business, people say, oh, you make clothing, oh, you make bedding, oh, you make this. Nice. Uh, like, they just don't get it yeah. because I don't think quilting is I, and I, this is it's not as let me put it this way it's not as big in New York as it probably it's is in not. other places it might be you guys have like one quilt shop I think now there's the Gotham quilts but there, there's I you know my, my I have a th- I have a, th- a theory about this I think it's because it takes space to quilt there's a lot of knitting shops and things like that but I think because uh, the price of real estate because we spent um, three weeks in New York this last summer and I was kind of amazed because we had done this huge six week trip all over the country and, and we ended up in New York for three weeks. And, um, yeah, I, I think it's space. Do you like New York city doesn't quilt really? I mean, if they do, they don't have quilt shops as much as other places like Vermont or, you know, New Hampshire, which has. Yeah. So, I mean, listen, but, but so in any case, my, my point being like, we just started seeing uh, there's a couple of places locally that are starting to do sewing classes. Yeah. And I'm not talking about New York City. I'm talking about the suburbs. Yeah. Um, but even then, I was pretty surprised. And I think <clears throat> I'm starting to ask more people. And as I talk to people, they're all saying, you know, a lot of people more than I expected are saying they're into sewing and quilting. Like I started asking my kids babysitters. Cool. And I was surprised to get a lot of yeses. Yeah. Really um, one of the uh, one of the other things um, that I did was um, I'm I'm on the board of the local JCC in my okay, cool. town, uh-huh. and um, for my parents' uh, seven what was it their, I think for their seventieth birthdays, my siblings and I endowed a program to the JCC called the Robert and Andrea Fortunoff Arts for a Community Program, where basically I told the JCC that I would support them with fabric. And we would do all kinds of arts and crafts and things with fabric. That's awesome. Um, so I also got them some sewing machines. And I was there the other night. They had a little sewing event. And I keep telling them, I said, I think you should have classes. I said, yeah. you know, if you build it, they will come. I think right. if you say we're having a class, people will come out of the Usually. woodwork. And you'll be surprised that I think there are a lot of hidden quilters out there yeah. waiting to uh, come out of their shells. Yeah. Interesting. Super interesting. Yeah, uh, so that's that's another thing I'm I'm kind of working on now. Super interesting. <coughs> what, what role does quilt market and uh, play within your business model, and what's what's the role of quilt market in the industry? Well, it's it was very important. I think it's losing its importance. Um, you know, listen, I, I I think I mentioned to you last week when we spoke that uh, that Abby Glassenberg had sent me a chart showing me that in the last five to ten years the vendors have gone down by a thousand, which went from 3000 to more or less 2000, which is a big, a big reduction. Yeah. Um, you know what? It's very expensive to get there. Uh, the quilt shops are not going there as much anymore because it's too expensive for them to come. They can't afford to be out of the shop and they're just seeing more of the same, you know, because all the companies are trying to dumb it down and save themselves money. They're not showing enough as much creativity as in the past. Uh, where a lot of the quilt shop owners would come and get their ideas. I mean, now you could go sit at home and go on social media and look at everyone's uh, websites and Facebook and Instagram, yeah. and you, all the ideas are there, and you, and you got to stay home. You didn't have to travel to you know Portland, Oregon, and pay for a hotel, and, and it gets expensive. Yeah. 
So uh, it definitely has gone down in in importance. Um, I've definitely been vocal with the people at Quilt Market and trying to talk to them like, you know, can you take the prices down? You know, we need to do something to mix it up and excite people. You know, it keeps we're going to the same kind of boring places, you know. I just think it's losing its cachet, unfortunately. Yeah. Interesting. <coughs> um, and what but, about, but, it, but it's a necessary evil, it's a unfortunately. Necessary evil. It, somebody told me that they didn't go one year and everyone thought they were out of business, that you have, to, you have to go to show you're still around. Do you feel that that's part of it as well? I don't know. I no. mean, if if we didn't go, everyone would still know we're in business. We have yeah. tons of sales reps and distributors out there selling our fabric. Yeah. Um, so it's only for the maybe the little like the smaller groups. Uh, but uh, but I could I could see I could definitely see how that's definitely possible. Yeah, yeah. And listen, it's tough. I mean, you know, why would it be surprising if one day a company didn't show up? They yeah. went out of business. It right. wouldn't be that surprising. Yeah. Uh, what about your sales reps? Tell us a little bit about sort of they go to uh, quilt shop to quilt shop, right? Right. Tell it, we, so, we ran into, not to yours, but a sales rep when we were at a sh- shop doing a launch event. So tell us a little bit about the life. And I would love to, if you're willing, to, to chat with somebody who does that because um, that's another part of the business. So that would be really interesting to learn about. So tell me a little bit well, about what they do. Well, just to, I'll give you a little bit. Of, so listen, we use distributors in the U.S. A lot of companies use them. There's maybe five to seven of them. Yeah. Uh, the big ones being Checker and Schenck. Um, and then people have their own sales reps. So sales reps come in two, two shapes and forms. One is a multi-line rep who could carry a variety of different companies, no particular loyalty to one company, except probably the one they do the best with. Um, and then more recently, a lot of companies started doing their own sa- exclusive sales force. So in some cases, they pay a draw or salary and a commission and could potentially pay for a car and insurance and things like that. Um, so we do a little bit of both. So for Henry Glass, Henry Glass, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have that's our oldest company. So we have a lot of reps who've been around a long time, that really the good multi-line reps who are out there and well-known, and they see a lot of the A shops, and everyone knows them and trusts them. And Henry Glass also uses distributors. Uh, internationally, we also use distributors as well. A lot of these different countries have distributors. We try not to have more than one distributor in a country, but once in a while that that does happen. So, and then for Studio E, Studio E uses uh, U.S. distributors and international distributors, and uh, Studio E was given to the blank sales rep. So when we bought blank, that was a really interesting asset for us because they had their own sales force exclusive to them as opposed to a multi-line rep mm-hmm. <clears throat> who's carrying many different lines and has no particular loyalty. So um, Blank, on the other hand, just uses those reps. We do not use any distributors. We just use our own reps, and it gives us a lot of flexibility um, because what happens with the distributors, if we say we're selling at $5 a yard, the distributors need to buy it, it make a 25% markup, uh, from that number. So if our rep goes from five dollars to four eighty five, and the distributor hears there's going to be a conflict. So we really have to stick to the prices. There really are no special benefits because uh, we really need to keep the field even. Uh, so the distributors are out selling at the same price that we are, um, and and that's how it goes. Um, so that's where we're at now. So our blank sales reps, we've tried to give them a bunch of different lines. Uh, we started distributing different things, air light batting. Uh, we distribute fabrics from Denmark. There's a company called Stoff, who was our distributor overseas that we now distribute their fabric. Um, we have we distribute Cycle. Cycle sells the NCAA fabric and some other licensed fabric. Uh, we sell, there's a new company called Oasis, two people who used to work at Another company in industry went out on their own, and um, that's what we're doing. So now we're kind of, I would say, like a pseudo distributor to that effect because we're just looking to make the sales. We want our reps to go out. We want them to sell as much as possible. We want them to make a good living and earn a lot of commissions. But while they're there, sell as much as they possibly can. And how many of these sales reps do you think you have? Like, what does it look like? We have around around 20. Interesting. Um, And we cover the whole U.S., uh, 
we do Alaska and Hawaii, but it's not really huge. Yeah. Um, but m- m- the m- the main part of the U.S., you know, listen. I-